So I wanted to build an apple grinder or scratter in a fruit press. I did a lot of designing here. This is uh, some 3D models of early ideas. I wanted to maybe put the scratter up top so it dumped right into the barrel, but discarded that for a more traditional design. This is all done in Blender, and I'm not really sure how I ever designed anything without it now that I use it for this. I wanted for this grinder to be modular. I wanted to be able to take it apart into constituent pieces without any tools, not even a screwdriver. Uh, I want it to be easy to clean. I want it to be relatively high capacity compared to some of the smaller presses that I've seen. I wanted to save money compared to buying a new one, and I wanted to reuse materials whenever I could. So I started by salvaging an old treadmill that I got for $50 on Craigslist, a Sports Art 6100E, and out of that very large industrial and heavy uh, treadmill, I got a 3 horsepower continuously variable speed motor, a really burly motor that's really overpowered for this job. I measured the RPM and it varies from about 70 at the low side to about 3000 RPM at the high end. So uh, it's gonna be able to cover whatever I need it to do. This is the motor box I built to house the motor. You can see there's a lot of stuff to pack in with the controller and all the associated electronics, the uh, interface board and everything, a lot of tight fits. I wanted to keep this box pretty structurally sound at the same time so that it uh, could handle you know, buckets of apples on top of it and that kind of thing. And of course there's some vents and so forth for airflow through the case. I had to hack some things. There's an incline motor that uh, treadmills often have and the computer would get confused when it wasn't connected. So I had to sort of wire up some resistors and stuff to present the right voltages to the control board so that it would be happy. The motor box itself is very heavy, something on the order of 50 or even 60 pounds, kind of a pain in the butt. Someday I might get a more appropriate sized motor to, to put on this so I don't have to lug this thing around and I'll use this for something else. The shaft of the motor, unfortunately, was 20 millimeters, or even more unfortunately, actually about 19 and a half millimeters. I had to get some shims to get it up to about 22 and a half in order to use this quick disconnect bushing, which itself was really expensive and difficult to find. This whole set of adapters and linkages and everything was very expensive and difficult to sort out. Uh, in fact, ended up being probably significantly more money than if I just bought a one horsepower motor new. This three horsepower motor new probably would have been a couple few hundred dollars at least, uh, but at least now that it's built, maybe I can reuse it for some other project. And before you ask, yes, I am gonna make a protective cowling around this whole belt drive. You can see there's also an adapter here for bike chain. This is ANSI number 40 roller chain. Um, I used a bike to power an apple grinder once and it was surprisingly easy. I thought it would be a lot of work, but it was just like going up a, a really gentle hill. Uh, it was kind of pleasant actually, and it'd be a lot nicer than having to carry the motor box around. So. Haven't done that yet, but uh, looking forward to that. I got this, uh, it's called a Freewheel Hub. It's just an old school style uh, bike gearing from a local community bike shop for like $2 or something, or they might've even just given it to me. And then there's a Freewheel Hub adapter that goes onto the shaft that I found online. Here on the side of the drum housing, you can see there's a cutout that allows for the adjustment of the drum housing. So that's not uh, locked in relation to the drum. We'll talk about that more in just a second. I read online that you want 6 to 15 meters per second or 20 to 50 feet per second in terms of the impact speed of the blades with the apples. At top speed, this grinder goes significantly faster than that. It goes up to about 25 meters per second or about 82 feet per second. At the rate I most commonly use it, it's about 46 feet per second or 14 meters per second, but I'm gonna go faster in the future. It actually turns out that when I use this faster, it seems to grind better. I'll talk more about the grind in a minute. These knobs here on the front allow for adjusting the thickness of the grind. In practice, I always just want it to be grinding as fine as possible because even at that setting, it's not quite fine enough. But it is still really nice having these knobs so that you can really precisely dial it in. I wouldn't want this to be set in a fixed position relative to the drum. You can see the sheet of aluminum here on the front makes the curve. I wasn't sure if that was going to be strong enough with all the apples slamming into it, but it's been holding up just fine. You can see it's also supported with these cross pieces of wood here to help keep it rigid. The particular curve of this aluminum, I uh, actually wrote a little program to figure out uh, in Blender. The idea was to have a uh, continuously decreasing distance from the axis of the drum uh, with a little bit of a fade in and fade out at the end. It was kind of nerdy. I'm not really sure in the end if it was necessary to worry about it that much. The apples bounce around all crazy no matter what you do, but uh, I kind of like the way it looks. There's a wood board here to stop the spray that would kick up from the backside of the drum. Uh, it's easily removable with these little clips when you want to clean things out. It's not so easy to do with one hand, but uh, trust me, with two hands it comes out real quick. The drum itself is five layers of white oak. 
if you don't have a lot of experience woodworking, uh, turning a very precise drum like this is probably the hardest part of the project from a technical perspective. Once I had it sort of roughly in shape, I put it on the frame here and uh, hooked up the motor and I turned it and then just was able to sand it down to uh, a smooth finish. You can use it as kind of a one-time lathe. A lot of folks just sort of rough cut the layers, glue it together, and then get a lathe tool and, and go across the front of it. I didn't end up needing to do that because I had a friend with some nice tools, but uh, as far as I know, it works pretty well that way too. I wanted to leave all the wood that was in the juice path unfinished, but uh, I learned the hard way that even if you wash all the juice off, the water that soaks into the wood that's internal here on the drum and the housing and everything can lead to molding. So after the first trial run, I realized I really just needed to finish it with something. I ended up using a linseed oil finish called Osmo Pollux, which I like a lot. It's really expensive and it does have some uh, chemicals in it to speed curing, but it um, seemed like a nice compromise. The teeth are made out of stainless steel hose clamps that are bent up and they uh, stand an eighth inch off of the drum. I actually had to take them all off and re-grind all of them because they were standing a little bit too tall, so try to get it right the first time. I think for this kind of grinder, lower is probably just better. I'm not sure if I could get them much lower without having some other way to attach them to the drum, because as it is, the tops of the screws are standing about an eighth of an inch off the drum already. Consistency is really important in the height of the teeth. If you have just one tooth that stands a little bit tall, then you have to adjust the housing so that it doesn't catch on that tooth, and now all of your teeth are too low except for that one tooth. So getting them all the same height and all pretty low is pretty important to get a nice tight gap between the teeth and the front of the grinder. Even with all this, there are still big flat pieces of apple that can come through about an eighth of an inch. It seems to grind most of the apple down just fine and then the last little piece just slides through. A friend of mine suggested that a lot of smaller teeth might do a better job because even though these pieces of apple will still come through at the end, they would at least be shredded up into smaller chunks. You can see that clearance on the sides of the drums is pretty tight. I wanted it that way to uh, minimize stuff getting stuck in there or any of the juice or pulp squeezing out the sides while it was grinding and uh, it seems to work fine the way it is. Here you can see the back panel of the motor box. The speed control is the only thing that matters on this panel, but it's kind of fun to have all the other readouts there. It makes it seem a little more high-tech than it actually is. I guess you can measure how much grinding you've done by how many miles you've supposedly run. Here's the power switch and the fuse and the venting. I blew a fuse once. I had it at max speed and shoved as many apples through as I could just to see how much it could take, and it slowed the motor down so much that it blew the fuse, so lesson learned there. Sits right on top of the bucket. I'm going to add a handle on the front so that swapping the buckets out will be easier, but it's not bad now. The legs are here. These are removable just by friction fit, and they have little adjustable feet on the bottom. When these adjustment bolts are backed all the way out, you can now remove the housing for easy cleaning. You can just hose it out. Getting this cut here just right so the housing could be maneuvered around the shaft and all the parts of the grinder required a lot of modeling in the computer and careful thinking. I actually used a digital projector to project that cutting path onto the plywood before I cut it out. Turned out great. This aluminum plate on the bottom catches the spray that wants to shoot backwards from the drum, which can escape over the top of the bucket and hit you in the legs while you're putting the apples in. This kind of attachment where you've got like a rotating drum that you're trying to securely attach to an axle is always a problem for me. You can get flanges, but they're always the wrong shape or they're too thick or the diameter of the bore is wrong or the screws that it gives you are only a half inch out from the axle instead of the six inches that you want or you want it really low profile and they're like four inches deep. I can never find one that I want no matter what combination of flange or hub that I Google. So if you know what the magic words are, please let me know. Or if you know of a supplier that makes stuff like that, let me know. I ended up with a solution I'm pretty happy with. I just used some quarter-inch steel square plates, had a friend with better tools than I have drill a precise hole in the middle, and then I just filed a keyway so I could lock it in with the shaft. Drilled some screw holes in the corners and uh, locked it in with the drum, and it's working great. Then I used a food-safe caulk around all the seams and the screws and stuff. Now, while this flange is stainless steel, the one on the other side actually is not, as you can clearly see here. So you'll hear from everybody that you should use stainless for every piece of the machine that's going to come in contact with the apple juice, and they're right. I thought I'd get away with it, but turns out apple juice is really corrosive, I'm assuming because of the acid in it. So was the food-safe caulk that I used, which cures via acetic acid and also instantly rusts everything it touches. So 
I couldn't afford a stainless steel shaft, unfortunately, so that's also regular steel in one of these plates, but everything else is stainless, and I'm just going to have to go with it for now. What I actually ended up doing was using some of that Osmo Pollux linseed oil finish and just sort of coating all the regular steel parts with it. Kind of a dumb solution, I know, but it's working for now, and if these parts do end up rusting, I can just take it apart and put some new parts in there if it comes to that. Here's that splash guard just from underneath. Behind the splash guard is this elastic cord. This just attaches to the back of the housing to help hold it down in case an apple tries to kick it up. Though the housing would probably butt up against the shaft anyway, and it's not really clear that it's necessary. The press itself uses a press plate of two three-quarter inch plywood pieces and an assortment of random non-pressure treated wood block 4x4 chunks that I had lying around. I'm using polyester bags that I bought online. They're working great, haven't torn or anything yet. At the top of the press, there's this metal plate to distribute the force of the jack, and then there's a wood piece to kind of center it, hold it in place. I wanted to make one of those fancy things that people use where the jack can just kind of hang from the top of the frame, but I didn't have access easily to a welder at the time, so didn't bother. The barrel was a pile of work. Uh, really took a lot of time. It's made out of maple. It's not finished, and that's been working out just fine. The hardest part was the strapping that goes around the outside. I just found it impossible to find the right kind of stock material to use for that. Something that wasn't too thick that I could still work with it without special metalworking tools. But man, difficult to find. I ended up using stainless steel zip ties. I had to use four of them because they're so thin. I think it's going to be fine for holding the outward force of the barrel. But it was really insufficient to hold the overall shape of the barrel. It just kind of wobbled around. So I had to add this ring at the top. The top ring is a uh, like quarter inch or something plywood and then the bottom ring is actually made out of aluminum. The gap between the staves probably too wide. I was a little worried the bag might end up ripping when it gets pushed through there. So far it hasn't been a problem though. These stainless steel zip ties were really long so I was able to just cut the end off and then just use the rest as a, as a stainless steel ribbon. There's a waffle board that I made at the bottom using maple left over from the barrel project and uh, pretty happy with that. It kind of took a while to make but it looks pretty cool. This aluminum baking pan, a couple inches deep, wanted to get three, and I wish I did because it overflows pretty quickly. But uh, right when I went to order the pans, they stopped selling them completely and apparently stopped making them all together, so in, in this diameter anyway. And it all drains through a stainless steel rain barrel hose fixture, which was far more expensive than I expected. The pan itself is lightly held in place with these little nice padded uh, fastener things here. The platform everything sits on is also double three-quarter inch plywood, uh, and that lifts off the frame with no attachments and just kind of slides out. Here you can see it from underneath. The larger cross pieces are for structural support, whereas the smaller strips in the center just located on the main press frame. The legs of the frame are totally removable by hand just by loosening these finger tight bolts here at the bottom. I added these vertical notched supports onto the legs after realizing that the platform was flexing way too much. Even though it's double three quarter inch plywood, it was just bending like rubber once the pressure built up. The frame overall, it's okay, but I didn't anticipate that the flexing would be so bad as it is. You can see here in these frames the difference between the press under tension and relaxed. There's really more flexing than I'm comfortable with. Even the 4x4 at the top is bending. So I can't really yard on the jack as much as I'd like to to build up the pressure as much as I want. Eventually, I'm just going to weld a metal frame onto the outside of uh, the wooden frame to hold it more rigidly, but that'll be a project for next summer. All told, I spent about $675 on this project, which was way more than I expected. I thought $150, $200 max. And in retrospect, I really probably should have just bought a grinder and a press. Even if it costs another $100, $200, it would have been worth it in the large amount of work I would have saved. But you live and learn. So let's see it work. As you can see here, the grinder is kind of a beast. It just chews through these apples without any trouble. This is at 50% of the max speed of the grinder. It's even more terrifying at full speed. It doesn't spit back too much unless you only add one apple at a time, in which case it can throw some apple chunks in your face. What you see here is actually an earlier grind. I think this is way too chunky, but this is before I lowered the teeth height and learned how to grind with a higher RPM. It's better now, but still not perfect. As I said, because the frame isn't quite as strong as I wish it was, I can't really work the jack too hard. I'm not an expert, but it seems like there is still a fair amount of juice in this pulp. There's always room for improvement, I suppose, but overall, pretty happy with it. Hope this video was useful for you. Let me know if you have any questions.